Hi everyone, my name is Alex Reich and I'm pleased to welcome you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine and to our monthly webinar series, Climate Conversations, Pathways to Action. The National Academies provide independent objective advice to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. In keeping with this mission, we're excited to host these conversations about issues relevant to national policy action on climate change. I'd like to acknowledge that the National Academy's Washington, D.C. headquarters is physically housed on the traditional land of the Noquenshtank and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have been its stewards throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land and acknowledge that the expertise held by different Native communities is crucial to the work of understanding and addressing climate change. Our conversation today will be recorded and available to view on this webpage immediately after the event. If you'd like to ask questions, please submit them in the box below the video at any time, and we'll incorporate them in a dedicated question and answer period in the final 20 minutes. We also invite you to participate in the polls that will appear in that same location and to give your feedback after the event in the survey linked above the video. Above, you'll also find a link to register for our May 19th climate conversation about how U.S. farmers are responding to changing climate conditions and how policies can support these efforts. If you want to be notified about other upcoming climate-related events at the academies, you can sign up for our newsletter, which is also linked above. Today, though, we're going to talk about how to respond to the rising seas already threatening people, property, and infrastructure on U.S. coastlines. I'm so pleased to be joined by Bob Kopp a professor and co-director of the Office of Climate Action at Rutgers, as well as director of the Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub and co-director of the Climate Impact Lab. Bob will introduce our conversationalists and moderate the event. Thank you again for joining the National Academies for Climate Conversations. Bob, it's all yours. Thank you, Alex, and thank you all for joining us today. We're, we're gonna talk about sea level rise and what we can do about it in the near term and the longer term. Now, according to FEMA, flooding, including flooding from hurricanes, is the most common and expensive weather-related disaster in the US. I'm in New Jersey, where we were badly affected by Hurricane Ida last year. And the Hurricane Ida, that one storm alone, caused about $75 billion worth of damage. With rising seas and intensifying rainfall, climate change is making flood disasters worse. Sea level has risen nearly a foot on average around the contiguous United States over the last century. And that means more extensive and more expensive flooding when big storms come, and it means more frequent tidal flooding. A 2021 study led by Climate Central showed that during Hurricane Sandy back in 2012, human caused sea level rise was responsible for about $8 billion or about 13% of the storm's overall damage while a 2019 study from the First Street Foundation showed nearly $16 billion of property value had been lost along the U.S. Atlantic and Gulf Coasts due to more frequent tidal flooding. With me today are two on-the-ground experts on how we adapt to changing coastal hazards. Tancred Miller is the Policy and Planning Manager for North Carolina's Division of Coastal Management, where he leads their work on coastal hazards and sea level rise resilience and has coordinated two scientific assessment reports across re on relative sea level rise in North Carolina and drafted the proposed state sea level rise policy. Christina Toms is a senior environmental scientist and ecological engineer at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, where she specializes on regulatory policies, restoration and adaptation designs, and conservation strategies to address climate change and support resilient habitats in the Bay Area. So I want to ask you each in turn, starting with you, Tancred, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to work in the sea level and coastal adaptation space? Absolutely. Thanks, Bob. And before I start, thank you to Alex and the other folks at the academies to have us uh, for this conversation. We're looking forward to uh, speaking with Christina and you, Bob, and, and getting a good conversation going. Uh, so my background, briefly, I was born in the Caribbean in Trinidad and Tobago and you know, grew up in an, an island nation where the sea was very much a part of your daily life. Uh, I came to the US for, for college, uh, ended up at the, the Duke Marine Lab in, in Beaufort, North Carolina, where you know, I could see sort of how people lived uh, with, with the water, at least in, in, in the North Carolina coastal region. I came to learn over time uh, how folks have been adapting, um, living with rising seas, with hurricanes, with flooding, uh, and, and seeing the disruption 
and it, very, it, it came really close to home for me with Hurricane Florence back in 2018 uh, when my family and I, our house was damaged by that storm and we had rain falling into our house for three days. And that's, it makes it very personal. Um, but to see the scale and the scope of, of the disruptions of the, the human toll, I think is, uh, is really hard to, to stand by if you are uh, in a position like Division of Coastal Management to stand by and, and do nothing. So it's, it's, it's a, both a professional and a personal uh, drive for me. How about you, Christina? Can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and what brought you to work on this? Sure. Well, I'm fortunate to be a native of the New Jersey Pine Barren, so I was fortunate to grow up in an area near the Jersey Shore where I had access to abundant open and natural spaces, and that really got me engaged in ecosystem recovery. Um, I pursued a bachelor's in biological resources engineering at the University of Maryland, focused on ecosystem restoration, then came out to Cal to UC Berkeley to get a master's in civil and environmental engineering, um, and worked in the private sector for a long time developing habitat restoration designs, uh, for projects here in the San Francisco estuary and out on the outer uh, Pacific coast of California. Over time, my focus really kind of shifted from um, not just uh, habitat restoration for endangered species, um, but really how do we integrate natural landscapes into the built environment? And what are the benefits that landscape scale ecosystem, re ecosystem restoration can provide to communities? And so with my work at the Regional Water Quality Control Board, we're a division of the California Environmental Protection Agency, and we're really focused on um, how do we uh, maximize the benefits of, of natural ecosystems? How do we protect waters and wetlands? Um, and, and how do we protect the built and natural environment through nature-based climate adaptation? So I mostly want to talk about um, what we are going to do about the problem, but I want to have one question uh, on sort of the pro characterizing the problem itself and whether you know, we as scientists are providing you guys as practitioners with the right information. So one of the things my research group at Rutgers does a lot of work on is sea level projections and their uncertainty. Um, and frankly, there's a very broad range of sea level rise projections driven in part uh, by the incomplete understanding of processes that are happening in the ice sheets and when the ice sheets interact in the ocean in part on the complexity of processes going from global scale to local scale, and in part on, on things that I think we scientists can't, can't claim uh, uh, credit for, which is that we don't know what human emissions are gonna be over the next several decades. Um, nonetheless, you know, that produces a pretty broad range for you guys. Um, the recent US interagency sea level projection report looked at scenarios ranging from about 30 centimeters or one foot of sea level rise over this century to two meters or nearly seven feet over the century. With the most likely projections falling in about the one and a half to three foot range, um, with the lower values being more likely if we're say on a sharply reduced emissions trajectories, the higher values more likely under higher emissions. But the report also noted that, you know, these processes we don't understand very well uh, with respect to ice sheet and ocean interactions could push sea level rise globally to five feet or even higher. Um, and what's more, Right, all these projections that we tend to look at stop in 2100, but you know, look at Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, severely damaged the tunnels under the Hudson River, which are at this point about 110 years old. So when right now, when we, we build new infrastructure, it's going to be some of that's going to be around well into the next century. So as practitioners, I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, maybe start with you, Christina. How do you grapple with this large breadth of possible futures coming from the natural sciences? Well, Bob, we're grateful here in the state of California, you helped contribute to the California State Sea Level Rise Guidance. So we actually take a probabilistic approach to those different sea level rise scenarios, and it's based in risk aversion. So for low impact infrastructure like trails, parks, open space, we can take a, a relatively less conservative approach um, to sea level rise adaptation and, and you know, maybe consider um, you know, some scenarios on, on the, the lower range of things. Um, but here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have a tremendous amount of critical infrastructure that is along the shoreline. So we don't necessarily have a huge amount of, of housing that's along the shoreline, but everything that, those, that that housing is dependent upon, things like highways, wastewater treatment plants, 
um, you know, schools, um, a lot of that is, is, is much closer to, to the shoreline. Um, and so we take a much more conservative approach um, to sea level rise adaptation uh, for that kind of infrastructure. So it really depends on, on the type of situation we're talking about. We also like to advocate for phased adaptation strategies. So that's basically figuring out, you know, what are the things you can do near term that aren't going to get in the way of your longer term adaptation strategies? Um, and how can you take early no regrets action that leave you the flexibility you need in the future to, to plan for and also to budget for these bigger climate adaptation projects? And Tancred, uh, we can give you a chance if, you, if you're taking a different approach or you chime in. Yeah, so I think we are, we are trying to become as sophisticated as California in our approach to, to dealing with sea level rise. Um, we, I think, we tend to, to, to uh, let the local governments do a lot of the driving at that scale. So where you have local infrastructure, housing stock, buildings, those types of things, we tend to be uh, more of a partner with those local governments to help them sort of understand uh, what, they're, what, they're, what they're seeing into context. And then you work with their communities to make decisions based on that. At the state level, we're certainly being, I think, a, a lot more um, introspective and, and, and strategic where we understand the science, we have the tools. Uh, Bob, you also did some work for North Carolina a little while ago, and we appreciate that as well. Um, but we have more tools at the state level, and we certainly have more um, understanding, and certainly now we have more political will uh, to get those, those gears turning. Um, but at, at the local level, you know, a lot of it's just based on what folks are experiencing. So that those sunny day flooding events that are becoming more and more frequent, more and more severe, uh, that's really driving a lot of the, the local demand uh, for, for solutions. So, so maybe you could, we can double click on that, uh, Tancred. So, so how are you seeing sea level rise impacting uh, communities in North Carolina and, and, and how, are, how are communities responding? You know, we had a series of hurricanes um, over the last six or seven years that really opened people's eyes to, uh, to the differences in uh, sort of this regime of storms versus previous uh, previous years. So uh, at the local level where you once heard things like, you know, skepticism over sea level rise, now it's more of a recognition that things are different, things are changing, uh, areas that are flooding that have never flooded before, um, water tables are higher, all these things that, that you know, the scientists talk about folks are experiencing um, firsthand. And so they're able to connect those dots on their own uh, and then demand solutions because this is their, their livelihoods at stake, their investments at stake. Um, this is their, their families, you know, this is where they live. So they're starting to demand uh, solutions from the local governments who then in turn uh, demand support from the state. And we in turn demand support from scientists and, and federal government. So it, it flows up the chain in this instance. So, Christina, I turn to you and ask, okay, if we think about the investments that we could be making to support these communities, um, can you talk a little bit about the idea of co-benefits? Um, how can we make these investments we make uh, to protect communities um, align with also goals of sort of general economic well-being and otherwise helping revitalize cities? Well, that's one of the reasons why we really place an emphasis on nature-based infrastructure. Nature-based infrastructure provides all kinds of co-benefits, not only habitat for native plants, fish, and wildlife, but it provides recreation, green, open space. I feel like if there's one lesson, well, I hope there's a lot of lessons we've walked away from COVID with, but um, one of them is the importance of outdoor space. And in a lot of urban areas in California, the most accessible outdoor space is the shoreline. It's our coastal areas. And so um, recognizing that, that the availability and access to that green open space is really critical for the mental and physical well being of our communities. And that's something that nature based infrastructure like wetlands, beaches, living shorelines, that's something that they provide. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to think about that. Um, also in California, we're looking at how we can use. Um, we have a type of infrastructure that we're developing called horizontal levees. They're these subsurface 
um, very gently sloped subsurface treatment wetlands. And um, we're using them to treat wastewater. They're, they're removing pollutants from wastewater that traditional engineered wastewater treatment systems can't remove, emerging contaminants like pharmaceuticals and other drugs that we, other pollutants that we really don't want in our waters. Um, and developing these systems to remove those pollutants, provide green and open space, provide habitat, and provide that wave attenuation for shoreline protection as I think a great example of the kind of multi multiple kinds of benefits that nature-based infrastructure can provide. Tanker, I wonder if you could take the flip side of that. So Christina talked about how um, you know, some of the options available, particularly nature-based solutions can have multiple different benefits uh, for communities. Um, what about the risks of maladaptation, either you know, investing in something now which you know, where, okay, maybe you get the coastal protection benefit, but you also get some, some negative impacts on the community or something that actually is positive in the near term, uh, but increases vulnerability in the longer term. Yeah, that's, that's a, real, a real concern. And, and side note, Christina, I'd love to follow up with you um, about these horizontal levees, because that's a really interesting idea. We've had some Absolutely. discussion about that. But anyway, uh, to your question, Bob, you know, it, it's a real risk. And I think, especially with the amount of federal investment that's flowing into states and local governments. Um, it's really historic and there's, there's great opportunity to, to make some bad decisions, make some bad investments and real pressure to spend those dollars you know, in a very quick and, and um, uh, very, I, I guess you're a very quick manner. So there's, there's a real, I think, likelihood that we will see some maladaptation. Um, we sort of throw around this term here called random acts of resilience and you know, there's a lot that fits under that umbrella. Uh, and what we've been trying to do is to bring some, some structure, some strategy to uh, some planning to, to how that, those investments are made. So we're working with local governments uh, currently on, on that long-term vulnerability assessment, strategic, strategic thinking, and then planning out how to make those investments. Uh, one step that I think is sort of lacking is then once you have these project ideas, how do you then vet those against each other to, to really know which are the best investments? And that's that's a place where I think um, we could use some assistance because we don't we don't really have uh, as you know Christina may have some some experience or you may have some some background, but we don't have really good uh, solid ideas on nature based nature based solutions that we can say for sure you know these are the best ways to spend your money in this situation with your particular circumstances. So that's, that's an area for us. And I think um, we'll do the best we can like everybody else, but uh, you know, there, there is going to be some, some negative uh, adaptation and we just sort of have to, I guess, deal with that on, on the back end. Yeah. So, I mean, I think what, what I hear is, you know, the importance of taking a risk-based approach and a strategic approach. I, I love your phrase, Tank Crit, about the random acts of resilience. Uh, and, you know, the, the project um, that Alex mentioned and he introduced me, the Megapolitan Coastal Transformation Hub, you know, one of the things we're focused on the New York City, New Jersey, Philadelphia region, but one of our, our key things is working with communities to help think about what is the full portfolio of levers you have to pull and, and, and when, you know, how long do they last and when, when might you go from one to another? And there's a lot of science we need in order to be able to, to address that as a complicated system. Um, so building off that, I want to take a, a deeper dive into the imp implications of sea level rise and coastal risks for policy and planning. Um, I also want to remind our reviewers or our viewers that they can submit questions um, at any time in the box under the video, and, and we'll get to those in the last 20 minutes or so. Um, so take for, uh, back to you, you sit at sort of a state level, um, you interact with federal governments, you interact with local communities, how are different level of levels of government in your experience uh, thinking about sea level rise and, and you know, where, where do we get positive interactions and where do we get people talking across purposes? Um, we had, fortunately, we have now had a series of executive orders from our governor who's you know, taken a really strong approach to adaptation, resilience, long-term resilience. Um, and it's positioned both the cabinet agencies as well as industry and the local governments to start thinking about and, and you know, tapping into resources from the state uh, to build local resilience, internal capacity and local resilience. Um, that's, that's the state level. We've done uh, our first ever climate science report in 2020, looking at just the state of North Carolina. We've done a statewide uh, risk assessment resilience plan. 
Um, we've done a series of uh, statewide, we've done a series of uh, local government meetings, listening sessions where we've heard from local government planning staff, um, et cetera, about uh, impacts and needs. Um, so we're engaging with, with local governments, we're engaging with each other across cabinet agencies. We're also certainly engaging with the federal government, uh, both on the, on the FEMA side, um, on the NOAA side, um, we, we, we're pulling in resources wherever we can. Uh, also, there's funding uh, available that we, we can go after. So I, I think there's a, there's a recognition and there's a, a good level of momentum uh, where folks are now pulling together uh, at, at all levels of government. Um, we, we have this sort of competitive resilient coastal communities program uh, and we have governments competing to get funds, basically. I mean, it's competing, uh, really, they'll, they'll get the funds as they become available, but um, they are showing a strong interest in, in, the, in the planning aspect and then the engineering aspect, et cetera. So uh, we're, we're trying to, to sort of break through those silos and make sure that everybody has access to resources and is communicating properly. And if I could follow up on that, um, I, I'd like to hear more about this sort of shift in, in positioning that, that, that you alluded to. I mean, the call maybe like eight or nine years ago, um, your state legislature um, decided, you know, if you look beyond 2050, the numbers are, are too large or too uncertain. So we're, you know, can't have the state do that. Um, and now you're sounds like now North Carolina is taking a much more um, proactive approach. Um, I wonder if you could reflect on how, you know, that that shift in direction has occurred and, and um, how that's affected the way you do your job. Sure. So we did our first sea level rise, our state level sea level rise assessment report back in 2010 um, and drafted a, a, a state policy for adaptation to sea level rise or, or support um, supporting local governments in adaptation to sea level rise back in 2012. Uh, that generated a lot, a lot of interest, um, some positive, some negative. Uh, ultimately, the legislature stepped in and said, um, let's just take a pause. Let's do another report in 2015. Uh, let's look at some different types or look at data so, sort of differently to, to, in, in one respect. They did not, um, Bob, they, they didn't say, let's just look to 2030 or, or 30 years out. That was sort of an internal decision uh, that we made at the uh, agency level. So um, the legislature left it, left it pretty wide open for us to look you know, as far out as we, as we wanted to. Um, we wanted to, I guess, use that as an opportunity to uh, make some more advances in the, in the public education and outreach realm. So that was sort of a tool to, to get folks more, I guess, in, mm -hmm. get folks sort of, you know, more comfortable with the, with the idea of sea level rise. Um, we do a lot of things on 30 year time cycles in North Carolina, probably elsewhere as well. So that, that was sort of a, an, an easy way to, to break through. Um, but then, as I mentioned before, you know, we had this, this string of hurricanes and these storms and this, this uh, sunny day flooding. And that's, I think, really what tipped the scales uh, to get us to, to the point where we are now, where we are really, you know, moving full steam ahead, trying to get, a, you know, catch up, I guess, uh, in a sense, and then get ahead of the curve a little bit on, on adaptation. Uh, that, that's interesting. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're a somewhat different political setting in, in New Jersey, but even so, like, you know, whenever we talk about sea level rise, we always hearken back to Hurricane Sandy. Like, you know, these big storms really are, are touch points uh, for focusing events for, for people. Um, Christina, I want to ask you about something which is definitely on a much, can be on a much longer time scale with 30 years, which is this with big infrastructure um, along the coast that you alluded to, um, you know, earlier when I think asked about how you deal with risk, you talked about the importance of, um, you know, being, thinking a pretty conservative approach with ports and transportation infrastructure, sewage and water treatment plants. Um, okay, so that so we so you be conservative in terms of how we deal with sea level rise protection. What does that actually mean in practice? What do we do with that information? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we're doing uh, at the regional board is we're responsible for issuing permits for the operations of all of these dischargers along the shoreline. So not only stormwater from transportation infrastructure, but also discharges from these wastewater treatment plants and um, containment plans for landfills and, and similar facilities. And so one of the things we've begun to do with our dischargers is work with them to say, okay, what are you planning for? What spatial and temporal frameworks are you using to plan for climate adaptation? What time scales are you using? Um, what risk aversion frameworks? Um, and, and, and what do you plan on doing? And if, you, if you're not 
making progress, why not? What's standing in your way? What resources, what information uh, do you need? And so um, that's, that's a relatively newer requirement that we've been developing. Um, one of the things we have been doing for quite some time um, with a lot of our partners, um, you know, Tancred mentioned, you know, how, how do you make these decisions about what you do at different scales? How do you get different levels of government to work together? One of the key things that we've been able to do with the Water Board is fund and inform the development of what, what's called the Shoreline Adaptation Atlas. And so we funded the San Francisco, area, San Francisco Estuary Institute and an urban planning nonprofit SPUR to develop a science-based spatial framework for determining where along the shoreline do you, do you take different kinds of approaches to climate change adaptation, specifically nature-based adaptation? Where might your only solutions be gray infrastructure versus where do you have opportunities um, for climate adaptation? And that allows, and, and, and it, it utilizes a spatial framework that's called operational landscape units. And we can talk about this a little more later, but they're basically um, scales of units of the landscape that they cross traditional political boundaries. So they cross county, city, special districts, but they operate at the scale of nature. So this is the scale of the tides, the waves, um, sediment transport, the, the processes that, that are actually driving flooding. So this is kind of provided, this is provided a real, um, it's, it's a non-regulatory document, it's just advisory, but it's helping communities funnel down, you know, there's so many different solutions that communities can implement. How do they determine which are right, which are scaled right um, for their communities? And it helps funnel down the range of, of practicable, feasible solutions. And that's been something that a lot of our partners have really grabbed onto. And so I think it really speaks to how central science has to be to this process, because it's a very explicitly science-based framework, but it's non-regulatory. It's really from the ground up. It's really about building collaboration across governments, across um, spatial scales. And we have found that to be, to be a, a useful element. So um, I think that's a model that can be replicated in a lot of different shorelines, um, including North Carolina and New Jersey. That, that, that idea of you know, having people brought together around natural uh, structures is, 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 I think, a very valuable one. You know, we, we do that um, in some extent in New Jersey uh, to various degrees, but like the Meadowlands Regional Authority. But it, when you think about it, it makes you think back to John Wesley Powell in the, in the 19th century when, you know, the West was being settled and he wanted the West to have state boundaries that followed watershed uh, districts and, and how different uh, uh, some of the history of the West might have been ha had that happened. Um, when I ask you, Maybe this is a related question, thinking about scales and the different elements of what goes into the, these natural landscape units. Um, you know, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you've got very dense areas. You also have, you know, much less dense areas. Um, how do the implications of sea level rise and the ways you deal with it differ between, say, downtown San Francisco and much more rural areas? So I think this is some place where environmental justice is, is really important because um, we have marginalized communities in both our urban and our rural areas in, in the San Francisco Bay region. And so those the needs of those communities really need to be prioritized because whether they're in urban or rural areas, um, they're often impacted not just by flood vulnerability, but also by limited access to clean air, clean water, um, health care, those kinds of elements. So I think equity really has to be central to this. Um, in rural areas in particular, you know, I, the San Francisco Bay region is a highly urbanized estuary. It's not like Chesapeake Bay. It's not like uh, the sounds of North Carolina. Um, and so we have to recognize that um, there's going to be some portions of San Francisco Bay where nature-based infrastructure, purely nature-based infrastructure might not cut it. And that's where hybrid infrastructure, hybrid green gray, things like pocket beaches in between revetments um, can be, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I grew up near the Jersey Shore, um, but I think, you know, those are approaches that can be really, really valuable in urban environments um, providing that climate adaptation, providing that green space, but still being done so in a fashion that that acknowledges that that you're in an urban environment mm -hmm. and that you just don't have the space, you don't have the landscapes for these future, purely nature-based solutions. In the rural areas, we have space. So in the rural areas, it's about where can we, what do we have to do to prepare the landscape 
for the movement, the transgression of habitats over time. So estuarine habitats are wetlands, are mudflats. They're going to move upslope. They're going to move inland. What do we need to do to facilitate that? Do we need to realign our infrastructure? Do we need to harden some of our you know, utilities, raise up our electrical transmission towers? Um, a whole host of things like that. So it's um, it's very, very um, landscape focused um, you know, and very specific to the type of landscape that you're in. So, Tancred, I, I want to turn that, that equity question over to you as well. Um, from your experience, how do we make sure that adaptation policies and planning sort of don't uh, exacerbate existing inequalities due to wealth and race? Gosh, I mean, that's, what a question. You know, equity, environmental justice, it's, it's so complicated. Um, you know, you look at the, the coastal plain of North Carolina, you know, we're, we're very different, obviously, from, from the West Coast, but you know, for the most part, it's very uh, low density, uh, very rural, agricultural, um, low income areas, uh, but spread out over the entire coastline. So, you know, how do you achieve equity? How do you achieve environmental justice in, in such a, a dispersed uh, landscape? Um, with so, you know, it's it's a really complex complex question. You know, it's it's not just a question of I think uh, making investments um, with with an eye to uh, equity. However, you define that, and defining that is not a simple question. Um, I, I think there's a really <laughs> really a subject for a, a, an entire session potentially because you know there, there's there's so many ways that you can slice and dice uh, and and sort of make winners and losers, and that's a really you know challenging and, and you know all inspiring responsibility to have to, to be involved in those types of decisions so um, I, I can't say that we have any any you know silver bullets any any you know great answers here in North Carolina I know we're looking at it very closely uh, from the secretary's office at, at my department uh, to the governor's office to the, all of the agencies we are we are thinking about it we're working hard on, on it um, but it, it's it remains a very very complex uh, topic. I mean, I guess if I, if I were to take away uh, one thing from both of those different elements that we talked on is you got to listen, right? You got to listen to the landscape and work with the landscape, whether that's a, you know, a, a heavily altered landscape or an urban landscape or, or a less altered one. And also you got to listen to the, to the people uh, who, who are there in the, in the landscape and you can't just come in with your, with a cookie cutter solution from the state or the, or the federal government. Um, I want to turn now uh, in our last few minutes before we get to audience questions about where we go from here. Um, so Tancred, um, what are some way com ways communities can be proactive about understanding uh, and addressing their risks along the coast? Well, um, if they want to understand the risk, I think they, they... Maybe the, the last thing I want to do is ask a scientist because who understands what scientists say? I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, Bob. Um, you know, really, they, they do need to educate themselves. There's, there's a, a wealth, you know, an overabundance of uh, information, uh, of support networks, of boundary organizations, of scientific, academic uh, institutions that have the information. And, and you know, there, there are multiple sources, as you mentioned earlier in, in, in the in the conversation and there are all these skills and they, they need help with interpreting and understand, understanding. And like Christina said, you know, it's, you know, what's their risk levels and all these types of things go into it. But uh, I think folks need to know and, and uh, understanding at least in North Carolina more and more that they're not isolated. They're not forgotten. They're not, you know, they, they do have uh, support networks. They can reach out to uh, both technical and financial uh, support certainly at the state level. So it, it's just a question of, of the curiosity and then having finding the capacity because that's another yeah. huge challenge is finding the capacity to ask those questions and, and understand. Well, and then follow up on on that. Do we have enough capacity? Um, I mean, you know, for for we have to actually do for the for the demand. If not enough communities are asking, but I ended if if every if every community started realizing they needed to ask. You know, you know, at Rutgers we have you know three or four people who can help you know work with communities on that. What what What's your level of capacity well, relative to what you think the demand for that should be? <laughs> um, we're, we're overwhelmed, I mean, frankly. 
uh, we're getting to the point actually where we have more money to spend than we have ways to spend it. Uh, spend it intelligently, I would say. Um, but certainly on, on the human side, we are we're very low resource. But that's you know that feels in comparison to to a local government. Uh, some many of our local governments that just don't have physically uh, people to ask the question, much less to yeah. uh, engage with the communities, et cetera. So capacity is a real, real challenge. Yeah, I would sort of say one thing we, we've been sort of tentatively doing in, in, in New Jersey, a couple of years ago, the state set up a Rutgers New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center, uh, which is trying to address this problem. But it, you have, you know, as I said, we have, I guess I have four people now, um, you know, in 535 different municipalities in the state. Um, you know, I think we have a lot of models and things like uh, cooperative extension at our land grant universities for a way that this could work, but, but I agree we're not there yet. So um, they want to ask you both, but first let's Christina, um, what sort of support do you at a local level need from the federal government to advance coastal adaptation and community resilience? Well, I definitely want to echo Tancred's um, plea for additional resources. You know, you can have all the, all the plans and everyone wants to fund projects. It's very sexy, um, but there's relatively less of a drive to fund the frameworks that can help inform smart project planning and help avoid that maladaptation. Um, and then funding for the staff necessary to make the right decisions about what to, you know, what kinds of project goes where, how you engage these communities, um, and, and how you make sure that you're doing the right thing. So the capacity is, is a huge thing. Um, and that's certainly something that the federal government can, can support um, at multiple levels. Um, with regards to specific actions that the federal government can take, um, in the Bay Area, there are definitely a couple of things that, that float to the top of that list. The biggest one is sediment. So the Army Corps of Engineers plays a huge role in managing sediment in the region um, with their navigational dredging operations. And there's something called the federal standard, which is basically um, the requirement that the, the core requirement that dredging be done um, in the least cost, uh, environmentally acceptable option. And how that shakes out is that that federal standard doesn't account for the cost of not using that material to support climate adaptation. So we're talking about dredging tens of millions of cubic yards of sediment that we could be using to build beaches, wetlands, to augment mud flats, um, to provide the sediment supplies so that our shorelines can keep pace with rising sea levels. And a tremendous amount of that sediment is being sent out and dumped in the open ocean. And that's because the simple, simply the accounting mechanism that the core uses um, doesn't account for the costs of not using that sediment to build that nature-based infrastructure. So if we could change the federal standard um, or just make it very, very explicit that if you're dredging material, if the core is dredging material, it should be beneficially reused to build nature-based infrastructure. Um, that would be a huge game changer because that's a really big challenge for us in the Bay Area. Um, we really need to focus on, on natural solutions. And we've been talking about that a lot today. Um, and I know that the Academy is invested in, in, in supporting uh, nature-based solutions and providing the science in support of them. But um, we need engineering guidance and standards from FEMA in the core um, for nature-based and multi-benefit infrastructure. That has to be, this has to be regionalized. A living shoreline in North Carolina or on the Gulf Coast is going to look very different from a living shoreline in California. And so this, this, this has to be based in regional local expertise so it can really be applied by decision makers. Um, and finally, we need greater recognition from federal permitting processes. I'm thinking of the Army Corps. I'm thinking of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the way that they think about take with regards to the Endangered Species Act. There's a lot of innovative um, nature-based solutions uh, that they require space um, and they may require some take of, of individuals um, in order to maintain the critical habitats and, and populations of endangered species. So, you know, often the most um, environmentally beneficial solution is not necessarily the one that has the smallest footprint of impact. And if we could get that more clearly reflected in our federal permitting processes, I think that would really help. Certainly in California, there's a big um, effort at the state and the regional level um, to clarify our policies and, and um, make sure that we're, that we're ready, that, that our, our policies and our regulations are climate ready. And we really need to see that um, echoed and reflected in federal planning and permitting uh, procedures. And Tancred, uh, 
before we go to Q, audience Q and A, what do you need at the state level uh, from the federal government? Well, I'll mention a couple of, of, of quick things, just follow up on what Christina just said. So we have a pretty, I think a pretty good uh, set, of, set of management program, <clears throat> excuse me, in North Carolina. The Corps have been, been a pretty good partner with us on reusing that sediment or at least putting it in places where we can go get it when the time comes that we want to put it back on the beach or something like that. So um, it's, it's positive. We also have you know good interactions with uh, BOEM, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, looking at things like uh, like sediment uh, use and, and availability. Um, so we have some positive going, things going on with the federal government. I'd say one thing, just going back to you know the conversation that we've been having today, is you know we've got getting all these funds in, and that's really really you know a wonderful thing to have these resources available to the state. Um, but just to, to hit on that maladaptation uh, subject again, you know one more time, um, the pressure is there to, to spend those funds quickly, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's going to lead to some bad decisions. I think having the ability to uh, lengthen that out, scale that up, and I understand there's there's political uh, implications there, but having the ability to, to, to plan that out, to build those frameworks that Christina mentioned and, and put those into uh, the best possible, um, best possible uh, uh, solu solutions, I think would be tremendously beneficial to the taxpayer to not have these just going into, you know, into you know, hurried projects because they have to spend money. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that puts me in the mind from thinking back to the Obama era stimulus um, I was I was working at the Department of Energy at the time, and it was just like you know the DOE got like you know ten times their annual budget in one year without any extra money for for staff to to figure out how to spend that smartly. Um, and if perhaps that, that that's sort of a, a danger uh, we, we're we're running when when we know we have big infrastructure needs and we're not necessarily investing in the capacity to have more people like you take it and you Kastrina to help uh, uh, manage it. Um, so I want to turn now to audience Q and A's. And I think building off of that um, and whichever one of you want, wants to take this. Uh, uh, so when communities compete for adaptation funds, uh, what they economically advantaged uh, communities tend to win. Uh, they're the ones that have the capacity to know what to apply for and what questions to ask. Um, so how are you making disadvantaged uh, communities more competitive? Maybe you start with you, Tinkred. Sure, yep. Uh, we, we designed our program with that specific uh, thing in mind. Um, first of all, it's, it's a very simple application. Um, it, you know, it, it, it can be written by pretty much anyone within a local government. It's, it's not complicated. It's, it's a deliberately low bar. Um, we, we don't uh, award any extra points for having high capacity or having a track record in doing these things. We, we actually try to, to um, sort of skew a little bit towards the lower resource. You know, we submitted a, a grant proposal to NIFWIF that was about building capacity and overcoming these obstacles. Uh, and because that was the specific intent uh, of, of our program is to, is to lift up these uh, lower resourced uh, local governments. So we also offer staff support if uh, folks are, you know, feeling challenged or, or intimidated by applying for funds. So we take that burden off them. We say, we can help you write your application. We take away the contracting to the extent we can. We say you don't have to worry about, you know, procurement. Um, if if state rules allow, you know, we'll do the procurement for you. We'll match you up with the contractor. We'll, you know, basically make this as low a bar as possible for them to participate and be be able to get uh, to build that that internal um, intellectual capacity uh, to, to continue on into the future. I'm tempted. It seems like a lot of what you're saying there isn't particularly or shouldn't particularly be adaptation specific. It's sort of how do we provide support to communities and their planning in, in general in an equitable fashion. Um, yep. Christina, do you, do you have something to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely it. You know, uh, climate is, we're finding, you know, climate is, it's not just an environmental thing, right? Like this is relevant to transportation planning. This is relevant to housing. This is, you know, relevant to all of these issues. So, so um, you know, to, to that degree, you know, these communities, EJ communities and you know marginalized communities are are affected by by so much more um, you know than just flooding and and sea level rise and so um, having that intersectionality to your programming I think is 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 really huge 
Um, specifically, you know, my agency, um, you know, we're recognizing that there are a lot of communities around the Bay that want to do the right thing when it comes to climate change adaptation, but they're just tremendously under-resourced. Mm -hmm. And so we're using our resources. Um, we're developing subsequent phases of the Adaptation Atlas that focus on our EJ communities and, and helping them um, provide the uh, or providing them with the collaborative framework and the science-based framework and, and going to them and, and not making it top down being like, well, we're the smart people in the room and we're gonna tell you what we think you should be doing. It's what are the needs of your community and how can we make that central to our planning and implementation process? And how can we build a plan for your community? What can we do to support you to get you where you wanna go, to get you that, to, to make you safe from flooding, but also to provide you with open space, you know, to help move your transportation, you know, uh, out of the way so you have, you know, reliable ways to, to get to work. Um, it's, 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 it's all of a, a part of that. I mean, again, it's, it's like what you're really saying is we need more uh, responsive and democratic governance uh, in order to do this. Uh, right? I mean, it's, it's, these, these are seem like general structural lift features and not, not just about, about flooding. Um, we have a question about adaptation pathways, uh, which Christina, you mentioned has uh, an approach that California is promoting, right? That's like when you say, okay, well, this strategy, say we're going to build, you know, with the, the marsh expand, well, that'll get us 20 years at, you know, and sea level rise projection A and 50 years in sea level rise projection B. And so the, the faster sea level rise, well, okay, then we need to know when well, we need to maybe start to relocate people out of this area or build a structure, right? How do we network these things together? So that's you know, a, a tool for dealing with deep uncertainties. It's something that that is one of the focuses and one of the approach we're using um, in the Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub. Um, but they're they're challenging. Um, they're, you know, it, I think in practice in the US, largely these are, you know, the Army Corps saying, okay, well, when we get one foot of sea level rise, we're going to add another foot and a half to, to the, the, the levee. Um, what is your experience actually working with these? And, and in particular question about how do you reconcile if you have multiple agencies, multiple stakeholders with disparate interests or goals? I think one of the biggest challenge, it's a really good question. And I don't know that any of us really know the perfect answer, but I think one of the central challenges is that, you know, you have um, capital improvement planning that tends to operate, you know, Tancred said North Carolina operates on 30 year cycles, right? And that's, that's true of, of a lot of transportation planning, land use planning, you know, it tends to, you know, happen in these, you know, 10, 20, 30, 30 year cycles. Um, and, and with the uncertainty of, you know, rates of, of sea level rise, we know the direction it's going, but we're not entirely sure when we're going to get there. Um, so how do you figure out, instead of using time as a trigger, um, how do you use amounts of sea level rise as a trigger? Mm -hmm. And so I think it, it requires you to have a, a really deeply iterative approach where you say, look, you know, we, we identify these near-term no regrets or minimal regret, you know, actions. And then over time, you know, you're going to get more information about your anticipated rates of sea level rise and when you might see these effects. And that can give you the lead time to do your capital improvement planning and to do your budgeting so that you're ready for the next step of adaptation. And so it's really as, as much about um, just, uh, you know, a, it's a different way of thinking about the passage of time and, and the, you know, budgeting. Um, and, and so I, Frankly, I, we don't have too many um, examples in California of of where that's been done yet. We, you know, we we have we have projects that have been implemented um, in anticipation um, of of certain um, changes. But for example, like I think we're still kind of stuck in this. Well, we think we're going to see this this much sea level rise by twenty fifty. So we're going to build this giant levee now, and mm -hmm. it'll be there for fifty years, and then we'll be fine. I would love to see more federal support for coming up with innovative ways to build this kind of infrastructure over time. Like, do we need to build levees entirely all at once? We have all of these competing needs for fill, not to harp on the sediment thing too much, but we have all of these you know, um, competing uh, uses for this material. Maybe we don't need to build everything to its maximum height all at once if we can figure out these better regional strategies for dealing with sediment and dealing with infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it gets back to the need for these, these spatial and temporal frameworks that are just different, but complementary to what we've been doing in the past. Well, if I can just add a, a quick uh, note to that, I think for, for North Carolina, the best example I, I can think of at the moment is our State Department of Transportation. 
that's taking that type of approach to uh, planning for two major thoroughfares that run across, across the state, basically to the coast. Uh, they're, they're looking at these types of, of, of pathways and uh, these sort of spatial temporal uh, triggers that might you know, require them to do certain things at certain times and certain places. So that's, uh, I think that's sort of a, probably the most innovative thing that I've seen to date uh, at the state level, looking at actual implementation. Um, but I think if it, uh, if it works well at, at DOT, you'd, you'd see that coming out into other uh, state agencies and hopefully other um, private sector places as well. So um, we think we have time for one last audience question. Um, and maybe Tinker, you, you can take this first and then Christina. Um, of course, we've, we've taken a pretty US centric approach. Um, what lessons or practices can we take from other countries' experiences? And, and the question asked specifically, for example, the Netherlands, which has been dealing uh, seriously with sea level rise and, and coastal flooding um, you know, at one level for hundreds of years and very seriously since the, the flood in the late 50s. Um, you know, there, there's certainly the, the examples that stand out of, of folks who've been dealing with, with sea level rise and sort of you know, held up as uh, the, the Netherlands, I guess, would be the obvious example of a, of a country that's, that's held up as uh, being sort of a standard bearer for, for sea, level rise, sea level rise adaptation. Um, I think they certainly have lessons to learn that, that, that we can learn here in the U.S. Uh, they've done a number of speaking engagements and partnerships uh, with folks around the country uh, on their approaches. And um, I, I don't know that we are set up uh, that the, the political frameworks are, are sufficiently analogous that uh, those lessons all translate. Um, but I think, you know, when you, when you mentioned before that, that democratic small D process, um, I think we can look to, to other nations, certainly island, island nations that have been grappling with uh, one lower resource uh, and two um, sort of more immediate impacts and, and less ways to deal with it. Uh, I think we can look at, uh, at some of those island nations and find you know how are they approaching um, their populations? I think that for me that's that's the, the most critical piece of this whole thing is the is the people part of this this equation. Um, how do we keep people whole uh, as we as we adapt and, and make sure that um, not just the you know where I am sitting to be in Florida, not just you know South Florida uh, gets all the resources or, or New York or you know Manhattan or et cetera, but make sure that 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 all populations are considered. Uh, and uh, afforded opportunities uh, to, to remain intact. Uh, Christina, anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, in California, you know, climate change is not just impacting sea level rise, but it's obviously impacting our extreme storms and our extreme droughts. And so, you know, when I look to Australia, the kind of climate whiplash that they've experienced over the last couple of years um, with the incredible bushfires followed up by record flooding in, in New South Wales, um, that's very similar to what California has been experiencing over the last couple of years, where we've had these tremendous wildfires um, in our upland terrestrial environments, um, followed by these enormous floods. They're really testing our traditional um, flood management infrastructure um, and, and creating a real challenge in our estuaries where sea level rise and these record floods, you know, come, come together. Um, and so, you know, I think... Um, it's it's important to recognize that that so many of these um, you know issues are are related that your flood capacity is influenced by what's coming out of your watersheds, which is influenced by wildfires. So if you get a big wildfire followed by a big flood, you're going to lose a lot of your flood management capacity, you're going to have increased flooding, these things are all connected. And so I think working with our partners in Australia um, and, and elsewhere, um, uh, New Zealand, South Africa also have kind of very similar environmental settings to California, um, you know, can help us uh, share, share information, share these planning frameworks and, and help develop a more resilient future for everyone. And in our final 90 seconds or so, um, if you take 40 seconds, um, Christina, uh, as a final question, what's one thing you want to make sure the audience takes away from this conversation? Long-term, landscape scale, nature-based. If you develop frameworks that are based in those three principles, you're 50% of the way there. And Tancred? Yeah, I would, I would add, uh, I mean, strategic. So they, they have to, there has to be a planning element to all of this. It, sh it shouldn't just be you know, a rush to, to build something, just say we build something. So long-term, landscape-based, uh, 
nature-based where possible and strategically planned. And I, I guess I would add to that, and we need capacity. Yeah, uh, right, adequate to, capacity. Uh, all right, well, thank you both for, for and thanks to the audience for, for joining us for this uh, really interesting conversation. I'm gonna hand it over um, to Alex uh, to close us out. Thanks, Bob. And thank you for your, sur your superb moderation, excuse me, and for your contributions about the science. And Christina and Tankard, thank you for sharing from your expertise and your work in this important area. What a rich conversation. Um, thanks to all of you at home or work for joining the National Academies for this month's Climate Conversations and for your questions. Our com the conversation was recorded and it'll be available to view on this same webpage immediately. Um, so if you want to go into greater depth on one part of this topic, natural infrastructure, where there were a lot of questions we didn't quite get to, um, you can join the National Academies on May 10th and 11th for a workshop on the benefits, applications, and opportunities of natural infrastructure for natural hazard resilience, climate change adaptation, and more. Um, I also invite you to join us on May 19th for our next climate conversation, which will be about how farmers throughout the U.S. are responding to changing climate conditions and how policies can support or hinder their innovative practices. The link to register is above the video. Um, you can also sign up for the Climate at the National Academy's newsletter to get notified about all our upcoming events. And as a final reminder, to share your feedback on today's event or ideas for future events, please see the survey link above or in the announcement below. It's just a few questions, and we really appreciate hearing from you. And lastly, thank you to the Climate Communications team at the National Academies and to everyone behind the scenes who supported today's event. We're excited to continue the conversation through future events like this. Stay safe and have a good one.